Speaking on this program is Franklin Kemp. The plan of salvation, I've been talking about faith, repentance, confession. And I've talked about how these are related to our life. Faith is not something that is a one-time thing. It's the beginning of our trust in God, and then that trust is expressed in all of our actions. Repentance has to do with a change of mind, the values. But repentance is not a one-time thing either. Since we cannot live perfect, we must continue to realize the importance of being penitent. And then confession. We ought to confess that Christ is God's Son, and all that's implied in that, but confession is not a one-time thing. We ought to still confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, just as we turn from them and repent of them, and as Earl leading the prayer this morning, almost at the beginning of his prayer, confessed our sinfulness before God, that we, through his grace and his blood, might be cleansed therefrom. We come now to study baptism. Baptism is not like faith or repentance or confession. When you're baptized right, scripturally, you only do that one time. And there are more questions, perhaps, about this subject than any other. It seems for, for from some reason, people have difficulty in understanding it. And yet, they don't have anything difficult about it. And so this morning and tonight, I want to discuss this subject. And to show you that it's not a difficult subject, it's my purpose to discuss this <coughs> subject and explain it with four simple words. The longest word is four letters. You would think that any subject that could be discussed thoroughly and completely with four simple words, the longest one being four letters. Why would people have any difficulty with it? Now, if you look at the charts, you'll see that baptism explained by four words. The first one is in. The little two-letter word, in, and that tells us something about baptism. In the Acts chapter 10 and verse 48, Peter commanded them, the household of Cornelius, to be baptized in the name of Christ. Now, the very fact that they are baptized in the name of Christ tells us something about this action. Of course, we understand, as we'll discuss a little bit later, that baptism is not separated from faith and repentance and confession. Those who are acquainted with churches of Christ will realize that always, before one is baptized, there is the expression of their faith in the acknowledgement of their sins and manifest in penitence, and also in confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But the fact that baptism is in the name of Christ ought to tell us something about its importance. Anything that is in the name of Christ would surely be something that's not just insignificant. First of all, in the name of Christ tells us that baptism is related to the person of Christ. And so baptism is not separated from Christ. Just as Christ is our Savior, baptism must be in relationship to Him, and in the name of Christ tells us that. If you took baptism and separate from Christ, and the things that, are, that precede baptism and all of them are related to Christ, it would be no value. For example, baptism is an expression of one's trust in Christ, faith in Christ. And if there was no faith, it'd be no good. For example, there are those that 
sprinkle babies and call that baptism. But that's not in the name of Christ and not in connection with Christ and apart from Christ because a baby can have no faith. In the second place, a baby has no sin. They're not born in sin. Jesus said in Matthew 18, Of such is the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, repentance must precede baptism. To baptize an impenitent person would be in vain. And thereby, the repentance grows out of one's realization of Christ. For example, Luke 24, Jesus said, now mark it, that repentance and remission of sins must be preached in my name. In my name. Beginning in Jerusalem. And so Christ is the motivation for repentance. And thereby, baptism is not separated from Christ, because first of all, it is an expression of one's trust in Christ. Second, it grows out of the motivation of the cross that leads one to become sorry for sin, produces godly heart, sorrow in the heart, which brings about repentance. But the same thing is true concerning confession. Matthew 10, 32, Jesus said, He that confesses me upon the earth, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. And so you can see that one then believing in Christ, repenting of his sins motivated by the death of Christ and the cross of Christ, Surely, baptism would not be separated from uh, Christ. And then, before he is baptized, confessing that he believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so, baptism then, if it has any value at all, and it does, must be seen in relationship to Christ. Baptism separated from Christ would have no value at all. It would bring no lesson. Blessed. It would be an empty act. And let us never then get the idea that baptism is an isolated act, separated from Christ, and thereby has nothing to do with our redemption and our salvation. But not only that, baptism is divine in origin. In Matthew uh, 21, verses 21 to 23, the scribes and the Pharisees asked Christ about the baptism of John. All right, they asked him by what authority he did those things, and Jesus in turn said, let me ask you a question. The baptism of John, is it from heaven or from me? That is, when he said, where did it originate? Who authorized it? Who is back of it? Who commanded it? Why is it being done? Here are people that are being baptized. They had heard John preach. Multitudes had been baptized by John the Baptist. In fact, that's exactly where his name was John, but his work was baptizing. In fact, the actual translation would be John the Immerser. The work of John was specifically baptizing. We'll say that here is a man... John Smith is a bricklayer. Now, what does that tell us? Bricklayer tells us what his employment, what his work was. So, when we read about John the Baptist, the Baptist is not a name. That had to do with his work. He was the immerser. And so Jesus said, the baptism of John, where did it originate? What is his origin? Where did it come from? From heaven? Or did that come from the wisdom of man? Did some man think that up? And then they didn't want to tell him. They didn't want to answer the question. He said, now if you'll tell me about the baptism of John, where it originated, then I'll answer your question. They said, if we say from heaven, then he'll say, why didn't you accept it then? If we say for men, we'll be in trouble. Because the people believe that John was a prophet. Now what's a prophet? 
a spokesman for God, one that God places his word in their mouth. And that's what a prophet is. And so they said, they say he's a prophet. That is, they say he was God sent. God told him what to say. God inspired him, gave him that word. And that being true, then they didn't want to admit that John's baptism was essential to a Jew at that particular time. Now the reason for that, in John 1, 6 I read, there was a man sent from God. Where? Sent from God. Whose name was John. Therefore, John was commissioned by God. The word sent there is the same word that we have translated apostle in other places. And so we could read that John was apostled by God. Well, that was a name. An apostle is one sent on a special mission. So John then was a man that was sent on a special mission. According to Isaiah 40, Malachi 3, he was the forerunner of Christ to prepare the way for Christ. And therefore, the baptism of John was divine in its origin. God sent him, told him to do it, and even the scribes and Pharisees said, If we say that it was from God, that it was, John was a prophet, then he'll want to know, why then did you not submit to it? Now, if the baptism of John was divine in origin because God sent him and commanded that, then what about the baptism that was authorized by Christ when he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What about that? In John chapter 20, Jesus said, As my Father has sent me. Now remember, John was a man sent from God. And the Pharisees said, The people believe he's a prophet. If we say that he was sent from God, and his baptism was divine in origin, they'll say, Why did you not submit to it then? Well, Jesus said, As my Father has sent me. And so Jesus was God sent. He was God sent even more than John. God sent him from his very throne in heaven, from the heavenly portals, from that invisible divine world, to come into the world on a mission. And Jesus said, God sent me. Now, God sent him, and Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If John's baptism was divine in origin, then Jesus even more so. For not only was he sent from heaven, he was God in the flesh. John 1, 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelled a tabernacle among us. Now then, that being true, you can see then when Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, that's telling us that it's divine in origin. Why then would anything that is divine in origin, given by Christ himself, be something insignificant? But not only that, in John 20, from which I read a while ago, Jesus said, As my Father has sent me, to the apostles now, even so send I you. And so God sent Christ. Christ said to his apostles, I am sending you now, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And thereby the apostles 
our sin. Jesus said of his apostle, He that receiveth you receiveth me. And in turn, him that sent me. So Jesus said, The one that listens to you and receives you and what you say, receives me. And in turn, receives God the Father that sent me. Now look at what you have. You have God, Christ, and the apostles commissioned and sent. Saying, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, how can someone say, but baptism is not important. Baptism really doesn't matter. We are able to see then that baptism is in uh, of divine origin. Not only that, does baptism conflict with grace? Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. I want you to note real carefully now uh, two or three passages in connection with it. Notice what Paul is going to say. Paul, an apostle writing, who has saved us. Paul, are you saved? Yes. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our own work. Paul, you're not saved by works then, are you? You're not saved by your own works. How then are you saved? But according to his purpose and grace. Now mark it. Paul said, number one, that he was saved with a holy calling. Second, that he was not saved by his own works. Third, that he was saved by grace. So Paul tells us, he was saved by grace, but not of his own works. Now listen to what Paul says in Acts twenty two sixteen. When Ananias uh, came to him, Paul reporting in this instance what took place, he said that Ananias said, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Why? And wash away thy sins. But Paul, I thought you said in Second Timothy one nine that God saved us not by works. Yes. How then did God save you not by work and you had to be baptized to wash away your sins? Baptism does not belong to that category of works. When he was baptized, he wasn't working to save his soul. He was expressing his trust in God and in Christ. And that trust was expressed by doing what Ananias told him to do. To rise and be baptized and wash away thy sin, calling upon the name of the Lord. How did Paul call on the name of the Lord? By expressing his faith and doing what God said. But listen again to Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. What are you saying? <clears throat> Not by works of righteousness which we have done. Well, what did? But according to his mercy. What? Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, what happened? He saved us. Now you are. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to his mercy that he saved us. Well, how did God save us by his mercy? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, what is the washing of regeneration? That's baptism. Now, you look at that passage. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by mercy or by grace. When and how and where did mercy and grace save? When he was washed in regeneration. That is in baptism. Ephesians 5 calls it the washing of water by the Word. Therefore, it was through baptism. In fact, the American Standard Version, instead of reading as the King James does, the King James says by the washing of regeneration. 
the American Standard Version says, through the washing of regeneration. The washing that belongs to regeneration. The washing that belongs to the new birth. What is it that belongs, what is the washing that belongs to the new birth? Baptism. Why? Because in being baptized, one is washed in the blood of Christ, and his sins are washed away. Now then, baptism then is related to the name of Christ by authority. It is an authoritative command. One cannot submit to Christ apart from being baptized just as the Bible teaches. But there's a second word that I want to talk with you about now. So our second word is by. We studied the word in, now we have the word by. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul said, By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Now the word by there has to do with direction, not element. Sometimes when people read 1 Corinthians 12, 13, they'll say, Well, that tells us that we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. No, that doesn't tell us we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. That tells us it's under the direction of the Holy Spirit that one's led to be baptized. The element is not Holy Spirit. The element is water. In Acts 10, 47, Peter said, Who can forbid water that these may not be baptized the way as we? In Acts chapter 8, Philip preached to the eunuch. And the eunuch was reading from Isaiah 53. And he said, Of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other? And Philip began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And we read that they came on their way to a certain water. And then he wanted to know what would hinder him from being baptized. And Philip pointed out to him, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He said, I do that. And the record said, they both went down into the water. Now what are they going to do while they're down in the water? And he baptized him. And then they came up out of the water. Now what was the element? Water. He came up out of the water. And we read that he rejoiced after his baptism. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 tells us that in order for one to be baptized scripturally, he must, it must be under the direction of the Spirit. For example, in Romans 8, 14, I believe I have that up on the, up on the chart, Romans 8, 14. Paul said, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Those that are led by the Spirit. In order for one to be a son of God then, it's necessary for one to be led uh, by the Spirit. The one that is not led by the Spirit then is not going to be the Son of God. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I believe the American Standard Version said the children of God. Who is a child of God? One that's led by the Spirit of God. Now, turn to the second chapter of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, we have the account of the Holy Spirit coming upon the apostles, verses 1 through 4. I read that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. What's happening? The Holy Spirit's come upon the apostles. They're speaking now in languages that can be understood. Or, there's not any doubt about that, because uh, verse 6 says, Now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together, 
and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in their own language. And so there was something to be understood. Then Peter then, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, preaches a sermon to them. And as a result, he comes down to verse 36 of Acts chapter 2, and he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now watch it. Now when they heard this, when they heard what? Heard Peter preaching. How was Peter preaching? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by the direction of the Holy Spirit. When they heard this, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now what's Peter's answer? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What? Be baptized. Now, Rocky, you drop down to verse 41, and I read, They that gladly received his word were baptized. Now what? Here are 3,000 souls led by the Spirit under the direction and the instruction of an apostle upon whom the Holy Spirit came and drew them his message and his word. And therefore when the 3,000 gladly received the word, didn't say they received the Holy Spirit, they received the word. The Word was the means by which the Holy Spirit led them. Therefore, receiving the Word, the direction of the Holy Spirit through the Word, they were led to be baptized. What Romans 8, 14 said? For as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God, or the children of God. Who are those people in Acts 2, 41? Children of God. How did they become children of God? By being led by the Spirit. Under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now, how could one go wrong in being baptized as he's led by the Spirit? You know the Spirit's not going to mislead somebody. But when the Spirit leads somebody, it leads them to baptism. And the one that stops short of baptism is not being led by the Spirit of God. So we have learned then that baptism is related to Christ by authority, the Holy Spirit by direction. And therefore, baptism is an authoritative command, but it's also a Spirit-directed person that comes to be baptized. Now, that's only half of it. Tonight, we'll talk about two more words that will further illustrate and show what baptism is all about. This morning I trust that you can understand that in spite of what the world says concerning this subject, that the simplicity of it in the Bible is amazing. And it's astounding how people could become so confused about something that is as, as simple as this. We have studied two words this morning, both these two letter words, in and by. So if you're here this morning, you understand that baptism is authorized by Christ to a penitent believer upon the confession of his faith, and that the Spirit through the Bible will lead you to do that. You're ready to be led by the Spirit through the Word to submit to that command to this morning in the authority of Christ. 